Turn in your Bibles, please, to Jonah. Jonah. And so Jonah is one of the minor prophets. So if you go to New Testament, beginning of Matthew, go back about eight books. And, uh, and you'll get to Jonah. And Jonah is one of these books that everyone knows about, right? You, you know the book of Jonah. Even if you're not a believer, you know the book of Jonah. You've heard the story. And it's a really simple book. I mean, there's only four chapters to it. But only being four chapters, again, it's most, one of the most well-known and certainly the, the idea of, man, of a man being in the belly of a well for three days and surviving contributes to its popularity, right? But so many themes can be explored in this short book. And I am so looking forward to exploring many of these themes over the next few weeks that we have together as we look at this book. But you, then you have the question, okay, here's all these things, but is it really about this or that? Is it about race and nationalism? As Jonah seems more concerned about his nation's military security than over a city that's in the crosshairs of God's wrath, right? Or is it about God's call to mission? A call that Jonah first rejects, later accepts, but regrets. Or maybe it's about the struggle believers have to obey and trust God. Well, the answer to that question is, is it about, is yes. It's about all of those things and so much more. Again, there's so many layers that we can start to peel back and explore when it comes to the book of Jonah. But again, we have to remind ourselves, this is a really simple book, but God packs a lot into these four chapters. Four chapters that really is about two incidents, right? Chapter one and two give a, in, in chapters one and two, God gives a command, but Jonah refuses to obey. Chapters three and four, God gives the command again, and Jonah carries it out. Big picture, that's what it's about, right? And it's an absolutely beautiful piece of literature, though, when you really start to look at it and you see the way that the author of this book wrote this book. And one of the commentaries I was studying, they broke it down and they said, listen, if you look at one and two and what's happening in one and two, and then if you lay it right beside three and four, it is absolutely amazing, almost a complete parallel pattern between these two chapters, chapter one and two, rather, and chapters three and four. We're going to look at some of those parallels over the next few weeks. But again, I was just struck by how absolutely beautiful this short book is. But if we're not careful when it comes to Jonah, when it comes to looking at some of the things about how beautiful the literature is, and when it comes to looking at some of the big stories like Jonah being swallowed by a fish. If we're not story, if we're not, if we're not careful, rather, we can start to see it as a story as rather more of a fable. Man rejects God, swallowed by a fish, decides to follow God, albeit begrudgingly, but God works. Even though the vessel that he's chosen to use is less than perfect, God works, right? So what's the moral of this lesson? Do what God says or he will send a big fish, right? <laughs> We can kind of boil it down sometimes. Jonah's just, just that, okay, this is what Jonah's about. And when we boil it down like that, again, we can start to think about it as a fable. Certainly, the culture at large looks at the book of Jonah as a fable. After all, a man swallowed by a fish and surviving for three days is just too fantastical to believe. That would require a miracle. That would require a miracle, right? Well... That's the core of what we're talking about here. That's the key word, isn't it? A miracle. But people get a little nervous today when you start talking about miracles, when you start talking about something happening outside of the ordinary realm of our understanding or us being able to explain. But that's exactly what's happened here. So this whole concept of miracle, we should embrace. I mean, after all, if you accept the existence of God, if you accept the reality that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, came, died for our sins, and rose again, a miracle such as this, a man being swallowed by a fish and living for three days, and that's not that big of a deal, is it? It's really not. And so we have to be careful to not think of Jonah as a fable. 
And if we're honest with one another, there have been times, God, did that really happen? God, that does seem a little too fantastical. And when we find ourselves kind of wondering and doubting and questioning, we just have to realize what we're doing. We've bought into some of the lies of our world and repent of that and say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Father, forgive me for doubting you, for doubting your word, for doubting your power to work in this kind of way. So again, if you accept the existence of God and if you accept, accept the reality of Jesus' death and resurrection, then there is nothing particularly hard to swallow about Jonah's tale, is there? Jesus certainly didn't think it was a fable or a myth. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I don't think Jesus would use a fable or a myth to point forward to the most important event in the history of mankind, the death and resurrection of the Son of God. No, he points back to Jonah because Jonah's reality. This is really what happened. And in the same way Jonah was in the belly of the, of the fish for three days, something similar is going to happen to me, as you will see. We can believe this wonderful book, brothers and sisters, even the fact that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. And as I was thinking about what to preach next, because I, I, I went into Daniel, of course, going to preach, I was preaching one through six, kind of the narrative part of Daniel. And then I was thinking about what do I preach next? What comes after Daniel? And I was thinking about the possible trap that we can sometimes fall into when we look at the, the stories of Daniel and what was happening, right? Because what happened when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the fiery furnace, right? It was the authorities coming against them, King Nebuchadnezzar specifically, right? Bow to the idol, and then we get to Daniel in chapter 6. And what is he supposed to do? Make no petition to man or gods for the next 30 days other than King Darius. And what does he do? He bows three times a day in his window for all to see, praying to the one true God, just as Scripture had called him to do. And so we have the culture coming against these men of faith, these faithful men and a faithless people. We're coming against them. And so I started thinking about myself and how I sometimes think. And we can oftentimes start to think of an us versus them mentality, right? It's us, the faithful, against them, the faithless. And we can't start thinking in those terms. That's dangerous. It's really dangerous when we start pitting us versus them because that's just not the way God thinks. That's not the way he thinks about humanity. We must always keep in mind that those who mistreat God's chosen are themselves being held captive by the lies of the devil. We need to see them not as adversaries who will be judged, but rather people who need Jesus. Now, the judgment part, that's, that's God. God will judge. He will judge the wicked. There's no doubt about that. But that's not for us to do, is it? Now, we can judge when people are doing wicked things. We can call wickedness what it is. But as far as us being jury, judge, and the ones who say you're guilty of, that's up to God. Our role in this is to say, but there's still a chance. But there's still a chance. As wicked as you are, as wicked as the things are that you're doing and saying, there's still a chance of God's mercy and grace in your life. That's what we're called to do, is to have hope for those who are lost. So as we begin our study of Jonah, we would do well to, do well to remember Tim Keller's words. He says this, the book of Jonah yields many insights about God's love for societies and people beyond the community of believers. 
about his opposition to toxic nationalism and disdain for other races, and about how to be in mission of to be in mission in the world despite the subtle and unavoidable power of idolatry in our own lives and hearts. Grasping these insights can make us bridge builders, peacemakers, and agents of reconciliation in the world. Such people are the need of the hour. Brothers and sisters, we are the ones that are called to be the bridge builders, the peacemakers, the agents of reconciliation in the world. And may God use the book of Jonah to open up our eyes to that reality. May we learn from this book. And may God do a work in our hearts because we might have a few tendencies, a few more tendencies that are very much in line with Jonah than we would like to admit. And maybe through the study of this work, of this book, God will open up our hearts to see, okay, God, I don't want to be in line with Jonah. I want to be in alignment with you, your heart for people, your heart for the nations. So we begin our study of this wonderful book, Jonah 1, 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. These are our three verses that we're going to be looking at today. I'm always, I always think I can bite off more than I actually can. I was thinking, oh, we're going to get through chapter one this Sunday. <laughs> then I actually started studying. So the question is, first, who was Jonah, the son of Amittai? So we don't have any background information here anyway, do we? No background information was given, meaning this, that Jonah must not have been unknown. That the Jewish people must have known about who this Jonah is. And indeed they did. 2 Kings 14.25 tells us that Jonah ministered during the reign of King Jeroboam the second. So there's two Jeroboams. This is the one that came after. In the 50th year of Amaziah, 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, which he made, which he made Israel to sin. He Again, Jeroboam, the second one, restored the border of Israel from Labo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord. That's a good thing. And the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. And so here we have Jonah serving at the same time Jeroboam the second was serving as king. He was a prophet at that time. But we also have Hosea and Amos. And they're serving at this time. They're contemporaries of Jonah. And what we see in Hosea and Amos is that they are criticizing the reigns of Jeroboam and Uzziah, pointing out the apostasy of the northern kingdom. For they had broke covenant with their covenant God. And so we read about Hosea and Amos speaking out against this particular king. Yet Jonah, in contrast, seems to have supported Jeroboam, Jeroboam's military policy to extend the nation's power and influence. But he seems to not be as concerned about God's king, Jeroboam, and God's people repenting, and that they would be a godly influence to the surrounding nations. So the original readers of this book would have remembered Jonah. They would have remembered him probably as a really patriotic Jew, right? Maybe a highly partisan nationalist. And there's nothing wrong with being a patriot. There's nothing wrong with being proud of the country from which you come. There's nothing wrong with that. But when that pride in your people or your country exceeds God's understanding and God's view of nationalities and peoples and so forth, when it exceeds that, and when you start to ignore God's view of people, humanity, nations, and so forth, and embrace yours even more fervently, that's a problem. And that's the problem that we have with Jonah here. 
So that's who Jonah is, a little bit more background there. So verses 1 and 2 would have been astounding to the original readers on so many levels. Because typically a Hebrew prophet called the people of God, fellow Jews, to repent. Now there were some exceptions, right? Primarily, the Hebrew prophets called the people of Israel to repent. But some of the exceptions were Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos. And they gave brief warnings to the pagan cultures around them, countries around them. But none of them were called to leave Israel like Jonah was. And here is God calling Jonah, again, an intensely patriotic and partisan nationalist, to leave Israel and go to a Gentile city and call them to repentance. But this wasn't just any Gentile city. This is Nineveh. And this is the capital of the Assyrian Empire, one of the cruelest and most violent empires of ancient times. And as I was reading about the Assyrian Empire, and as I was reading about how cruel they were, I thought about bringing some of the examples that I decided I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you can Google it if you like. Because it was horrific. But let me just, let, let, instead of giving examples, this one quote suffice. One historian said, Assyrian history is as gory and blood-curdling a history as we know. And there's some really horrific cultures out there. Not only were they cruel people, but they had been oppressing Israel for many, many years. The empire had started exacting heavy tribute from Israel during the reign of King Yehu, 842 to 815 B.C., and it continued throughout the lifetime of Jonah. So again, keep in mind, this is an incredibly cool, uh, cruel empire, not cool, cruel empire, incredibly cruel. And now they've started oppressing his people. It's been happening for years and years. He's been a witness to it. And in 722 BC, the Assyrians actually invaded the Jewish northern kingdom of Israel and its capital, Samaria. Now, this is the nation, keep in mind, that was the object of God's missionary outreach. Does that blow your mind? This is the nation that was the object of God's missionary outreach. Jonah was not sent to be a herald of certain doom. If that had been the case, if... Hey, you're telling me to go to that country and tell them they're done for? They're doomed? There's no hope for them? You got it. I'm out of here. I'll go do that. I'm going to stand up on the hill there and watch it happen, right? But that's not what he's telling them to do. He's not saying, Jonah, I want you to go and tell them that their time is up, that I'm going to destroy them for all that they have done. That's not what he's saying at all. If that had been, he would have, again, made him happy. No, he was to call them to repentance. Now, let's stop for a moment and put some of these pieces together, right? Nineveh, capital city of the Assyrian Empire, one of the most brutal and most cruel empires we've ever known. An empire that was actively oppressing God's people, especially the northern kingdom, Israel. A kingdom led by Jeroboam who desired to see the kingdom's power expand. A king who had committed apostasy, that had broken covenant with God. And now the apostate king was supported by Jonah, who again was very much pro-Israel and would be vehemently opposed to any people who would come against his country and his people. Understandably so, right? We understand where Jonah's coming from. But this is the country that Jonah's being called to go to. To not tell them your time is up, your time is over. No, to tell them you still have time but only if you repent. Again, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for, the evil, for their evil has come before me. Now, when he calls him to do this, could, could it have been possibly fear? 
possibly fear that Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh? I mean, it, it would be as if you're to go to Baghdad, the corner of Baghdad, and start proclaiming the one true God, that he has, that he has now judged Baghdad wanting right? You've been weighed on the scales and you have been found wanting. And so therefore he is going to destroy you. Your time is limited. Now I'm out of here, right? You wouldn't get out of there. You would be killed. So he, Jonah understands, I think what God is calling him to, but is that the reason that he doesn't go? That instead he, he goes down and he finds a boat. He says, Oh Lord is not, I'm sorry, back up a little bit. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Was he just fearful? And I'm going to get away from you, God. And I think this presence of the Lord is also telling as far as his view of Israel. This is kind of where God resides. Yes, he tells the sailors a little bit later. Yes, God made the, the, the seas and the land. But I think I think Jonah had this very kind of small view of God, that God kind of was in Israel, and that was it. If I get out, get out of Israel, I'll kind of get away from his presence. Well, he knew that wasn't the case, or he found out that wasn't the case anyway. So again, if this had been to announce impending doom, Jonah would have probably been all in, but he knows that's not the case. And why is that? Because we go a little bit further. In Jonah 4.1, he says, but it displeased. This is after God relents, Right? This is after the people of Nineveh here, and we're going to get to all of this, but this is a little snapshot. This is after the people here, and they repent, and God relents, right? He says, okay, I'm not going to destroy you now. And of course, Jonah is not very happy. Jonah 4.1 says, but is displeased, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee for to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. I knew it. I knew it. I knew you were going to have mercy on these people. So an open rebellion, and that's what it is, brothers and sisters. Open rebellion. Jonah says no to God's plan. A plan that he doesn't like and can't make sense of. Therefore, he says, I'm not doing it. I'll have no part in this. He knows that God is a gracious God. He knows that he's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and willing to relent and show mercy, even to the most wicked of sinners. Wicked of sinners that had been brutal toward God's own people. Jonah couldn't reconcile this in his heart, in his head, could he? It's just not right to save people like this. And I have no part of it. Jonah should be thankful for God's mercy. Because he shows it toward him twice, doesn't he? He rescues Jonah from the sea, which we'll study, and later shelters him from the sun, again, which we'll study. And he just shows Jonah mercy over and over. Matter of fact, his whole life, God had been showing Jonah mercy. And Jonah is struggling with the question of this word we call theodicy. Not the odyssey, theodicy. Are God's compassionate actions just? That's the question. Are God's compassionate actions just? Can a righteous God possibly forgive the wicked inhabitants of Nineveh? A wicked people who are actively opposing and oppressing your people. So he has theological issues, yes. But even more, he has heart issues. Right? He has heart issues. Jonah has forgotten his own sin. Jonah has forgotten the mercy and grace that has been shown to him and that he is living wholly by the mercy of God. Indeed, God's position toward Jonah's people is one of complete grace, isn't it? There was nothing special in the, in, in the people of Israel. There's nothing special about the Jewish people other than God placing his favor upon them, 
right? There was nothing within them, this group of people. They said, wow, they are really different. They are so different. I'm going to place my favor upon these people. No, it was absolutely his grace and his mercy that he says, I'm choosing this people as my very own. And Jonah had just forgotten. He had forgotten about how often his people had turned their backs on the living God. How often they had sought after and followed other false gods. How often God had, yes, judged them, but then restored them. After they repented, continually, continually showing mercy to these stiff-necked people. Jonah had forgotten all about that. And as long as that is the condition of his heart, Jonah's heart, he will never understand how God can be merciful to evil people and still be just and faithful. So that's where Jonah camps out here for a little while, doesn't he? God is a just God, so he must smite the Ninevites. But God is also a faithful God. He must be faithful to his people. How can he be faithful when he shows mercy to his people's enemies? But that's when we oftentimes have a very narrow view of God's faithfulness, right? God has to be faithful to who he is. And God has a heart of compassion. God is long-suffering. God desires to see the wicked repent. And so Jonah was forgetting about that aspect of God's faithfulness, that he must be faithful to his own character. So the theological issue for us really has been taken care of. How can God be show mercy, rather, toward a people that are enemies of him, or enemies of his people? Well, we understand how God has taken care of that for us, Right? Because we understand that Christ has become our sacrifice. The righteous for the unrighteous. We're the unrighteous, by the way. That he is just in judging the sinner, but can also justify the sinner who places their faith in his son. His requirement of justice for a person's sin being met and fulfilled through the atoning work of Christ. So this question that Jonah had, which is a good question, has been answered for us in Christ Jesus. This is how he can be merciful. Through his son. So Jonah had this heart problem, but this isn't just Jonah's heart problem. This is a problem that can also be our heart issue as well. We can become comfortable in our salvation. We can become comfortable in the grace and the mercy that is continually shown to us. Can't we? We can. And we can start to lose the heart of God in reaching the lost or even maybe or maybe especially the most wicked of sinners. I remember, and I've I've told this story before, but I remember when I first became a believer when I was 20 years old and I had come out of just a life of rebellion, right? Right? I mean, I was rebellion, rebelling against God. I was rebelling against my parents. I was rebelling against anything and everything. And God broke through. And he broke through in such an amazing and miraculous way that my life was transformed. And it was such a radical transformation for me that it was, it was just night and day, right? It was like someone had flipped the switch and I'd gone from darkness to light and I got it and I understood. And not only had I, did I understand that I had gone from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light, but I also had a lot of friends that were still in that domain of darkness. Not only friends of mine, but I would look around and, and I would see people that were in darkness and I would ask the question driving down the road, does that person know Jesus? Standing in line at the grocery store, does this person in front of me know Jesus? Those were the types of questions that I would have when I first became a believer. And then over time, that type of mentality, that type of question wasn't asked as often by me. Sometimes I even caught myself not asking the question, do they know Jesus? Man, I wonder if they know Jesus. To, they don't know Jesus. Right? And having a more judgmental attitude 
toward the unbeliever than an attitude of pity and mercy and desiring them to, to experience the same experience that I had had so many years ago when that light switch had been switched and I was transferred again from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light. When I had been regenerated, born again, not by anything I had done, not because all of a sudden, you know, I had really started to try to help people out and, and work, work, work toward my, No, nothing like that. It was God's grace toward me that saved me from my sins, that transformed me, that transformed my thinking. And all of a sudden, the way I started viewing the world and viewing people around me, that was transformed. But over time, over time, I stopped thinking again about unbelievers in the way that I had, having this passionate, uh, this, this compassion for them and a, a pity and, a, and, a, and a, des a desire to see them experience what I had experienced. I'm not going to ask for any hands here, but I'm sure that many of you have experienced the same thing. All of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, I'm maybe not cold hearted, toward the unbeliever, but I'm certainly not compassionate toward them. When I see someone struggling, one of the first things I do is not wonder, do they, need Je do they know Jesus? Do they need Jesus? How can, I, how can I be a light for them? No. Oftentimes it doesn't even cross my mind in that situation. I wish I could tell you different. I wish I could tell you that my days are full of praying for people that are lost. My days are full of any time I see someone that I know doesn't know Jesus, just doing what I can, trying to figure it out. How can I be creative and showing them the love of Jesus? I wish that were the case. But it's not. I want it to be, though. I want to be more passionate. And I, I go through spells, and I'm sure all of you guys do as well, where you become much more engaged, where you become much more passionate, where you become much more um, yeah, compassionate about those that don't know Jesus. And so you do. You're more intentional about having those conversations. You're more intentional about making sure that you've got that New Testament in your car that you can hand to someone standing at a gas pump, right? I go through those. Brothers and sisters, I'm not saying that every moment of every second of every day we have to be absolutely passionate about the lost. We have to be on the street corners, no, those types of things. No, I'm not saying that. We also have to live our lives, right? We have to do a good job at work. We love our families well. Love our body, the, 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 our brothers and sisters in the church well, all of those types of things. We are called to live this fully orbed life, but oftentimes we allow all these other things to kind of cloud out and push aside this passion for the lost and a desire. Let's not even use the word passion because that can be a little strong, right? Just a desire to see the lost come to know Jesus. So Jonah's heart problem was our, is our heart problem because oftentimes we forget God's grace that has been shown to us. We forget God's mercy that has been shown to us. And we can replace a heart and passion for the lost with political agendas, right? Getting really involved in politics or even church-related activities that are devoid of gospel intent and impact in reality. So we may not get on a ship, right, to avoid what God is calling us to, but we can find other diversions that oftentimes can carry us further away from our calling, further away from God's heart for the lost, or at least mute the call, making it easier to ignore. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to just stop with the diversions. I'm ready to take an inventory of my life and say, Lord Jesus, what have I put in place that really is muting that call? What have I put in my place that I feel really good about? And I feel like, man, this is, this is good stuff. But in reality, it might be good, but it's not best. 
And because it's just not good and not best, it's muting the real call that you've placed upon us as your children. The thing is, God has a way of helping his children see when our priorities have become confused and need to be rearranged to be more in alignment with his mind and heart. In the case of Jonah, he uses a big fish. But even then, as we'll look at, we don't see a real heart change in Jonah, do we? We see him doing it, but not happily. Yes, Lord. Yes, they're going to repent, and I get to be the bearer of this news. Yes, praise you, God. No. He begrudgingly does what God calls him to do. And sometimes I think we begrudgingly do what God calls us to do. I don't know about you, but I don't want to do it begrudgingly. Do you? I want to do it with a full heart. Again, remembering the grace that has been shown to me. Remembering where I was before and where I am now. Far from perfect, but praise God, no no longer in the domain of darkness. Amen? So may this not be the case with us. May we not do the things that God calls us to because it's just, this is my duty as a Christian. No. May we do it because we desire to make Christ known. Because we desire for people who are broken, who are hurting, who are far from God to come close to God and experience the healing that I've experienced, that you've experienced. And sometimes I I think maybe we have a little bit of a doubt. Well, God can really God do something in their life. He did something in my life. He did something in your life. And brothers and sisters, well, I don't know all of your stories. I know this. Every single one of you were sinners and were far from God. And he invaded your heart. He came in. His spirit took you from darkness to light. Every single one of you who have submitted your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, he has done that work, that miracle in you. And if he could do it in you, he could do it in anyone. So brothers and sisters, let us recapture that, right? That sense of awe and wonder that God is in the business of saving sinners. No matter how wicked they may be, like the ones from Nineveh, Or no matter how good of a life, good of a life a person may have lived, right? They're basically good people. They do good things. You kind of look at them and say, man, are they they believers? Look at their life. But brothers and sisters, we know that oftentimes those are the hardest hearts. Those are the hardest to proclaim goodness or truth to because, well, they're pretty good already. But brothers and sisters, God can break in there as well. Let us not put God in a box. Let us say, God, you do what you want to do, and you use me as a vessel to do it, however you see fit. But God, please do a work in my heart first. Give me a passion. Give me a desire. And may we allow God to do what he needs to do and willingly accept his work in our lives. What do I mean by that? God's not just going to force his way in. God's not just going to force his way in and start remolding our hearts. He desires for us to be open to that. He desires for us to say, yes, Lord Jesus, come. Do your work of renovation that you need to do. I know it's a mess in there. I know. Forgive me. I wish I could have cleaned up a little bit before you came, but I know that's just worthless. That doesn't do anything. So you just come in here and you do what you need to do. And he will. Because we know that he loves us and desires the best for us. And that means realigning our hearts and our minds with his. A heart and mind that sees the world not as enemies that must be defeated, but as people who are in bondage and desperately need new life. Life found only in Christ. Christ. So my heart and my prayer, and I'm asking you please to be praying with me as we go through this book, is that may the Lord use this study of Jonah to that end, to do a work in our hearts. The work that each one of us needs, because the work is different for all of us, right? And the wonderful and beautiful thing is we are sons and daughters of the living God, and no one knows us better than he does. No one knows our heart condition condition better than he does, so he knows what we need. 
And so open yourself up. Say, Father, you know how cold I am right now. You know how apathetic I am right now toward the lost. Do that work that you need to do in me, whatever that may look like. Maybe you're passionate about the lost. Praise God. Ask God to give you even more passion and then give you opportunity. Give you opportunity to share that good news. And it is good news with those around you.